Space is the next Navy. It's the next. It, it's like it, it's like another war zone. It's going to it, be a battle, highly contested and highly congested environment. And there are no rules of engagement in space. Hello and welcome to the Cube's Pod, episode two. Dave, I'm John Furrier. Hey, John Vellante. We're back for our second pod. First one was kind of our inaugural pod, Dave. We got it off the blocks on a Friday when you record breaking analysis. Learned a lot and uh, had a great time. And uh, we're back for episode two. Again, as I was joking on Twitter to the All In podcast with Jason Kalkanis, is that we had six views right out of the gate. There, are six million more to go. Well, watch out, we're coming for you. Um, got a lot of great feedback on the pod. People say it's the All In pod for enterprise. I thought that was pretty cool. And um, just overall, first one was awesome. Looking forward to today. I mean, ton of news. We're going to review the news. We're going to go into the digital disruption dig into where the money's being made. Ultimately, there's the, a lot of cringe factor going on with a lot of the politics around tech uh, and just a, a, a ton of stuff to talk about, Dave. Big time action this week. Yeah, and we still got earnings are trickling out. We got Mobile World Congress coming up uh, next week. And uh, yes, never ends in tech, John. <laughs> yeah, well, let's get into it. I mean, I mean, the goal of the podcast, we'll try to get more consistent. The feedback was get the show notes right. We're working on that. So just, we'll get our groove, we'll get a couple in, just look beta mode here. But I think well, let's get into the news. I mean, to me, I had a couple interviews this week I thought were notable. One was Swami, who heads up the database AI for Amazon Web Services, who we've known for a long time. He opened up and, and talked a lot about how Amazon views the open AI trend of ChatGPT on the heels of Microsoft, obviously a competitor. But we really also talked about how deep it is. Like, and, and they have this new announcement, Hugging Face Expanded News. That's basically their answer to OpenAI and Chat GPT with Bing. And how much, just in the past three years, how it's opened up. Uh, that's also Amr Awadala, founder of Cloudera. His company was on the Cube this week too, uh, as part of a news segment around AI as well. Massive amount of traction with this generative AI, Dave. This is, to me, the big story of this pod is, is, is the news there is, Generative AI is, is a wave. It's, it could be bigger than other waves we've seen that have been major inflection points. The PC, internet working, the internet, mobile. And I think, I would say social media was one big one, but given kind of how that's turned out, I think gen, generative AI and foundation models, this chat GPT direction is big enough because there's so much behind it. There's infrastructure, there's apps, there's middleware, it's data, it's just, it's just, is going to be huge. You know, I, I want to say it, there's a lot of sort of AI washing going on. I know that uh, everybody, anybody who I now, mean, NVIDIA on its call talked about, you know, AI, stock pops. But, and people might think Amazon's doing the same, but you, I don't know if you remember, John, when you were out uh, talking to Andy uh, or Adam Slipsky last fall before reInvent, he actually talked about the importance of la large language models and generative AI as a you know bef well before Chat GPT came out, and so yeah, I mean, you know how it is in tech. It's like the NFL. If if one person's thinking about it or they do it, everybody else is right there. Um, it's it's a it's a copycat league kind of thing, and there are going to be different ways to skin that cat. We talked about you know maybe Chat GPT d doesn't have first mover advantage. George Gilbert actually, when he heard me say that or us talk about that, said, actually, they're, they're getting a lot of early sort of warning signs and, and tuning the model. So they actually may have a first mover advantage. So, you know, we'll see. Well, I think I argued on that uh, pod, on that conversation uh, against the first mover advantage. I think they do have a first mover advantage, but yeah, also, might be but, right. but the competition's coming in massive. Uh, Meta announced, Facebook or Meta now announced, their large language model. So the big dogs are coming in and weighing in with their stuff. Google, so, Microsoft. So Meta, Meta, like, okay, hey, you know, we 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 spent a ton of dough on the metaverse. Uh, oop, now we're going to pivot to large language models. So, okay, yeah, good, we'll see. Well, this is the thing. I mean, Meta, so let's look. Google, Facebook, now Meta, Microsoft, Amazon. Okay, the only company that hasn't weighed in is Apple. Okay, and you got Alibaba out there, but you look at these big giants, they are poised for large language model. I did a little sample on my feed with LinkedIn and Twitter, took a few things about entrepreneurship and VC, I put it in chat GPT. It wrote a killer job a memo to CEO founders for startups. It said, and literally was all the stuff people are talking about, it put it into a memo. This is the future, Dave. This is about 
you know, automating intellect and, and, and changing the game as, as uh, Amar Awadala calls it, uh, former Cloudera, now the founder of uh, Victara. This is real. I mean, I think this is going to be one of those moments where apps are going to become super apps with AI as part of it, big time built in as AI first. That'll, that'll probably come out very soon. We're an AI first company. I guarantee you the, the surge of startups will be coming in. VCs will get pitches all day long and they're going to they're going to go at pedigree. Oh, you went to MIT neural networks. Here's 10 million dollars. Go. There's going to Done. be a massive tsunami of unsophisticated VCs throwing money at credentialed AI people, which if you think about it, as Paul Graham will point out, that's the antithesis of how Silicon Valley is. It's not about where you went to school. So I think there's going to be this wave of AI where it's like, oh, you know AI? Here, here's some money. I don't you, think that's healthy in my opinion, but that's do, my, my do, opinion. Do, do you think you, you of course remember when Microsoft had the Trojan horse with DOS, with the IBM PC and Microsoft ended up being dominant. Do you think do you think OpenAI can pull a similar kind of judo move with Microsoft? Well, OpenAI is going to be interesting to watch. If they're going to be the single source of LLM, large language models, that's going to be in, in, in contradictory to what I think is going to be the wave, which is large language models working together and then threaded together with some sort of fusion around code and, and, and like a DevOps model around data. Um, I don't think they win on the monolithic where we are the source of all things LLM. They have to have integration with other models and that's going to be, to me, the, the, the winner or loser. Again, that's, that's coming down to the old proprietary or loosely coupled, highly cohesive. And I think the web services market proved that that's a better model. So we'll see. I mean, I don't know. I mean, my guess is that it would go not, it would go against OpenAI. I think OpenAI could be the Netscape uh, I think, of, of, I think it, yeah, which means which means they get out fast and there's all this hype and then somebody else you know beats them. But the other thing too I want to point out is I think that the enterprise application of AI is going to be different. It's got to be cleaner. It's got to be more accurate, all the ethics and the privacy, all that other stuff. It can't be as error prone as chat GPT when you're talking about security or logistics and supply chain or running a warehouse and robots or a smart factory. So the enterprise AI is is got a much higher bar, I think, than what we're seeing with ChatGPT, even though I love well, we're, playing we're, with ChatGPT. Well, we're going to come back to the Section 230 in DC Supreme Court, but the big guys have an advantage on the, on the AI, Dave. And I think the phrase I liked I heard from my um, podcast with Amar Awadala and the, his team was this new term called prompt engineering. We're prompting the AI as the skill. That's the engineering talent of the new AI DevOps-like mindset. And I think that'll be codified. I think you're going to see a lot of apps. This is what the top alpha geeks are talking about, Dave. They're like, they're like all over this AI. And then you got like the big banks banning it. Like you had the UNC discussion last week where they're don't let people use it at school. And you got big banks, you got Goldman, Morgan, all the top New York banks are banning ChatGPT. And then you got a tsunami of startups on the other hand, just coming in, getting funding left and right. And all the alpha in the know people are saying, this is the next big thing, which we're saying too. So you got an interesting market, shut it down, let it go. That to me you, is interesting. But you saw the, also you saw the Medium post, the professor from Wharton said, I'm forcing my students to use uh, generative AI, so they can learn how to prompt. It was an awesome article. If you haven't seen it, you, I know you did. You shared it with me. But he gave five progressively more sophisticated prompts, and I think that's the right model. You have to learn how to interact with the system, and that level of creativity should be taught, yeah. not banned. So the question on the table is: Is that does this give the big players like Amazon, Google, Microsoft? Uh, LinkedIn, these large hyperscale content markets, the advantage over any startups. Because just this week, Dave, in DC, Section 230 of the Fel Telecommunications Act of 1996 is being argued in Supreme Court, and it's a contentious argument about the big companies and that section. So is it the, is it the law or is it the companies that are causing innovation stunting or is it, are they actually helping innovation? That, and you know where I stand on this. <laughs> all right, what's your take on the, section 230? The, 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 well, the, first of all, let me say it, market forces are much more powerful than I think uh, our, our government intervention. Having said that, something like section 230 could put some handcuffs on, on the large uh, companies if in fact 
Although right now it looks like the Supreme Court is going to rule in favor with the large companies. Like, how are they going to be able to adjudicate here? But I, I think in general, it's hubris, it's market forces. It's like the article uh, about Google that that is so sort of inwardly focused on not on, on pleasing everybody that they're missing some opportunities. And so I, I I generally think when when we oftentimes feel like, oh, these companies are at a peak. It was like reminds me of Windows 95, Microsoft in, in 1995. Microsoft will never be beat. And then it was like decades that they were you know, in irrelevance. And I think just technology moves so fast. A open AI came out of nowhere as a perfect example of a potential disruptor to all these big tech companies. Well, I think the, the, the Section 230 discussion, the question isn't about the, the big tech companies. The question is, did the Section 230 cause all the harm? Or was the, is it the tech companies that did it? So you know, if you look at some of the arguments there, what is Section 2, 230 about? It was written in 1996, and it was last updated in 1934. So you got 1934, 1996, 2023. In 1996, Bill Clinton was president. The internet was just starting. The web had a handful of websites. So Section 230 protected free speech and allowed the online platforms to develop this innovation. So the question is, what's better right now for Section 230? Is it, does it help innovation or does it hurt innovation? Does it create more competition to replace Facebook? I mean, Facebook really is a monopoly. At the end of the day, I mean, who's going to take out Facebook and Instagram, WhatsApp? Nobody. And if Section 230 doesn't get fixed. TikTok. TikTok. Well, not if it gets banned and it was announced, banned in the U, uh, European Union this week. But it's, a, but it's a proxy for disruption, right? I mean, somebody else will do the next TikTok. I mean, I, I don't buy that these, these companies are in, insurmountable. Um, but, you know, again, I've said last week that if a company is uh, behaving like a monopoly and using its monopoly powers illegally, it should be regulated by the government. No question about it. Well, but Section the, 230, Dave, is about who's responsible, not about monopoly. I, I, so I, well, is, I is, Facebook, that, is Facebook responsible Is Facebook responsible for the death of, of that person from the ISIS? Uh, it's a hard one to argue, I think. I mean, you're basically, I'm, I'm, I'm inferring from what you're saying that they are responsible, but you know, I mean, I think ultimately it's the individual. It's the person who pulls the trigger, not the gun maker, right? But not yeah. that you shouldn't regulate, you know, says. certain firearms. But yeah, it does with Section 230. And I think it was, even though it's an old law, I think it was written, you know, very thoughtfully. And so I, 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 I think there's probably certain guardrails that you can put on these large tech companies. Um, and I think they have pigged out on advertising. So I, I think that's fair. But but that the backlash that's coming from that, you got to be careful what you wish for and, and the unintended consequences of you know limiting free speech. Yeah, and I, and I think the, I think Section Two Hundred and Thirty can't be changed to support the big tech companies. I think there are two different issues: the big tech companies versus the Section Two Hundred and Thirty has to promote competition. I totally agree with you on that. Competition is critical to keeping everyone in check. I mean, I think the bad behavior from all this is from the big tech companies because they had no incentive to be checked on that. And I think that's the one thing that Section 230 is a little bit outdated on is in 1996, there was no internet the way it is now. So a completely different environment, but it was designed to protect free speech and promote innovation. That is the, th the, the tenant of Section 230 and the Decency Act as part of the Telecommunications Act. Hey, do we even use that word anymore, telecommunications? Uh, I mean, well, I mean we, I, I, we're going at I, Mobile World Congress, telco industry. I, what does it even mean to be a telco? But, but I do kind of liken it to the Second Amendment. I was sort of alluding to that before, whereas, okay, you know, you're not going to ban, ban guns, but there's no reason you can't have more control you know, banning assault weapons, having background checks, things like that are are prudent. And and when the founding fathers wrote the Second Amendment, they couldn't imagine, you know, the power of firearms, just like you're saying, you know, back in the 30s and, you know, the early days of the internet, we couldn't imagine how this could be abused. And so certain guardrails should be put in place. But I, I don't think it's right to swing to fl completely flip you know the law. I, I don't. I don't think that is the the, the should be the the outcome. Well, I mean, we'll see. I mean, we're watching that closely. I mean, the companies can get sued. We're a media company. We can be sued for what's on our our properties. Uh, Facebook. Those go. Hey, we're not posting anything. So it's a very interesting. We'll see. Has a huge, huge 
discussion. This this ruling will be pretty epic. It's going to impact all the big guys. We're we'll watching it. Uh, of course, they all have cloud computing technology and large language models. So again, I, I think there's so much change coming. I, I'm anti-government personally. You know my viewing on this. So you know we'll get to that in our rant section later. But let's keep on the news. <laughs> telco disruption. You got Amazon launched um, the new um, telco cloud native world going with their new with their new product, now, Telco Builder. You got HP just bought a private cellular company. A lot of stuff going on in this telecom world, Dave. Mobile World Congress around the corner. Cloud native is going to drive drive train down the tracks to crush the telcos. Are they playing chicken with the train, or what's going to happen? What are your what's your opinion on this? Well, I think that the, the telcos are, are definitely ripe for disruption. And it's a, the fundamental trend, as we've talked about, is the disaggregation of the hardened telco stack. When you break that in, we've seen this movie before, when you break it into horizontal layers, that just opens up competition. It also opens up, you know, seams as well. So you got to have ecosystems. Then the cloud is right there uh, for that disruption. The one thing I would say is, that is in the favor of maybe some of the legacy companies is because the cloud does generally outpace the Dells and the HPEs and the Cisco's and IBM's of the world and Oracle's. But this market's going to move very slowly, number one. Number two is a lot of the telcos are really paranoid about the cloud doing an end run and putting their own private networks, putting in their own local zones and bypassing the connectivity requirements of the telcos. And so I do think there's going to be a hybrid model that, that emerges. And then you saw, you mentioned the HPE bought Ethernet. Dell had a deal with them to do private uh, networks and then HP, like the next day or two later, buys the company. So now I guess Dell and HPE are, are partnering. And so that's probably not going to last too long, but um, there's so much going on in that business because it's super large, it's entrenched, uh, but it's, it's, it's blowing up in ways that uh, are really kind of interesting, exciting, and kind of hard to predict. And the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, the 5G networks have taken a long time to build out. Everybody, I think the hype, has it's not lived up to the hype, and we've talked about this, it's going to take years, but it's going to happen. It absolutely has to happen. And then there's this whole other conversation around energy, because as we blow out the 5G networks at massive scale and bring in all this new data and throw AI on it. AI is compute heavy. It's going to suck up so much energy. So the sort of the, the greening of the network, I think it's going to be a big deal this decade. I think that brings up a great point. I was kind of hinting at that and you kind of helped me think about it differently is 5G and all the telco innovation has been slow and they've had a monopoly too. They've had positions with the, with the poles and the, the transit. Cloud native, okay. And the discussion of edge computing is huge. So I think the battle, the HP buying the company that Dell was doing business with as their, their ace in the hole for, for private and wireless for enterprises, you're starting to see this battle at the edge, Dave. This is like the next frontier. We brought it up last week on the pod. This is more evidence that the distributed edge, cloud native edge enabled computing is coming through the telcos. The carriers will, either adopt or be crushed. But how do you crush a carrier that's got all that footprint? This is an yeah. interesting game of chicken. As the train comes down the tracks, their telcos are sitting on the on the tracks. So who's going to move first? How long can you stand there before you get run over? What did, I mean, that to me is my angle on this, is that it's clear that cloud native is coming and how long, how fast can they gear up and not get run over? Yeah, and the big question, John, is in a world with without telephone poles and wires, you know, can the telcos move beyond connectivity? Yeah. I mean, that they've lived off of connectivity for decades and they've, they've not shown that they can move fast enough. Having said that, they're really good at making networks reliable, you know, and, 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 and providing really good service levels. So who's going to do that? Um, you know, especially in this world of, 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 of open RAN and, well, and, and, and on open ecosystems. And so, you know, telcos are engineering firms at, at their heart. And, and so I, I think they're going to have a hand in this. And I think they're, they've, they've, they've got to embrace cloud native. There's no way around that. You know, the question is, can they move fast enough and, 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 and not allow and, and, and dip their toe enough into the cloud 
to sort of keep keep them close, you know, keep your friends close, your enemies closer, kind of thing. Yeah, can they play that game with the cloud players? Well, They're going to have to. Well, they got they got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of stuff already hitting that kind of ties into national security. We'll get into that. But well, while we're on the mobile telco angle, Chinese military researchers say China plans to build and deploy a network of thirteen thousand low orbit satellites before Starlink network is complete by 2027 from the South China Morning Post. So Elon Musk, Starlink, it's also the one year anniversary this week of the Ukraine war, which by the way has survived all the Russian, you know, sort of uh, cyber warfare, which, you know, it's been known that the Ukraine has been a test kitchen for all Russian cybersecurity maneuvers. That's like their beta playground. And now Ukraine has survived all that with help of the United States and allies, as we're learning from our reporting, is that it's been a huge win. So you got China, Russia, now you got China with satellites. They could drop down satellites from space and, and, and control networking from there. So, you know, that's going to be a huge discussion point in the future. And I think at Mobile World Congress, you're going to see a lot of international China phones being discussed. So it'd be very interesting to see next week, Dave, when you're there, what the the international vibe is, okay? You got the European Commission uh, can't, uh, banning TikTok for any employees uh, on, on their phone. That's a surveillance question. So China's got low-hanging satellites before Starlink. Telcos are being disrupted by the cloud players. Where did, this is gonna end. This might not end well, or maybe. John, you remember when we were in uh, at Mobile World Congress in uh, 2021, in July, in June and July of 2021, and Elon Musk came in via satellite, and he was asked, uh, you know, what's your intention here? And the first thing he said is, not to run out of money, like every... Other, like all the predecessors before me. So now you got the, the Chinese government, you know, can fund that build out. And, and to your other point about Ukraine being a proxy, the future of war is what's playing out in Ukraine. Yeah, there are, there are bombs and, and, and terrible destruction, but it's also cyber. Uh, and and you're talking about satellites. That's going to be the the future of warfare that we're we're looking yeah. at here unfold right before us. And on that note, I just want to say this week I was out a chance to meet up with John Markoff, former New York Times writer. He was hosting a book reading in Palo Alto by uh, Nicole Perloff, and she wrote a book called "This This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends." Ten years of research on cybersecurity. She opened up the zero day marketplace story. She broke that story. Real in-depth report, she's the one who told me about the test kitchen vibe that Ukraine was essentially a test kitchen for the, the Russians. I mean, they were doing all kinds of things, taking down the power grid, shutting off utilities. She was actually there in Kyiv when it actually happened. So real interesting dynamics going on. And then her point was, is that during the Ukraine war now, the allies have all helped, the United States and others. Russia got beat by them in the cyber game. So the little subplot to the whole Ukraine war is that there's been a cyber war going on in their own turf. It's like a home game for the Russians and they still lost. So it's very interesting to see how the cyber warfare is gonna continue when the red line is still article five and no one will drop below that line unless there's loss of life. And then I said, you know, there's been examples of fetal monitors dying in hospital ransomware attacks where infants were killed. That's technically a US death. So there's a whole military doctrine debate going on around how to handle cyber warfare. This is going to be an ongoing point to this podcast, Dave. I'm telling you, this is not going away. I remember when I interviewed uh, Robert Gates uh, on the Cube, and I said to him, yeah, but don't we have the best cyber technology? Can't we go in the offense? He goes, yeah, we can. But the problem is we, we got a lot to lose as well. So our critic, I mean, the, the the attacks on critical infrastructure this year are are up. I thought I saw a stat the other day up like forty percent, and so you know we're yeah. the U.S. is more vulnerable because you know we're in, such a in, successful country. In Nicole's uh, just presentation, she mentioned I don't know if this is in the book. I haven't gotten to, to through the book yet, but she said that one of the and her uh, research came up from from a source was the NSA had all the, the the jewels and all the best hacking technology, best ransomware best code to fight cyber warfare and be on the offense. Well, the, they got hacked and someone took the entire arsenal of tech code that went into the open market. That created the beginning of the zero day marketplace and other nefarious actors. Because once the NSA got robbed, 
that was out in the open market and it's been going on since. So a lot of the roots of the hacks from solar winds to Equifax, all the big hacks, stuck next, all that stuff, Dave, it's all because the NSA got hacked. So and, and nobody's the safe. And, and the next wave is AI. The, the attackers have AI and they're going to be applying AI to identify and, and, and scale and audit. And they're already a lot highly automated, but they're going to take that to the next level. You know, you're going to, You've already got AI writing code. People joke, "Oh, well, it's it's writing bad code, and humans have to have to debug it." But nonetheless, AI is going to be allow the attackers to just be more effective. So a lot of digital disruption, a lot of news. We'll get to the earnings in a sec, but I want to bring up something while we're on the the the, the big digital digital disruption. Um, notable news: AWS um, got their one medical billion dollar, four billion dollar acquisition. I think it was four billion approved by the by the. Uh, got approved, no FTC action. There was threat that there was action going to be taken on that. And that's interesting. That's a healthcare opportunity where, you know, you bring Amazon Prime to healthcare. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've said this many times that the, the, the most interesting thing to me about digital is that these, these big, large tech companies, they have a, a dual disruption agenda. On the one hand, they're providing horizontal technologies across, you know, the te the technology world, you know, cloud, storage, server, compute, uh, AI, etc., data. As well, they're disrupting whether it's finance, healthcare, grocery, logistics. Not always, not always successful, but they're able to do that because digital is data, and they're able to traverse industries like you've never seen this before. It used to be if you're in. If you're in a, a, a particular manufacturing industry, you you stay there, and and that's that's changing. Yeah, this is the show me the money part because this, Dave, this is the section we want to get into. The, you know, you look at the success of the earnings season that came out. You see the one medical type trend. That's healthcare. That's that's more service oriented. You're starting to see these these industries being refactored. So there's almost a trend where you're starting to see the visibility into what's working and what's not. Right, the earnings that are doing well. Palo Alto Networks, NVIDIA, others are failing. There's a pattern. If you're not on this, this right side of history right now, which is cloud native, scalable apps, super cloud, it, you're not doing well, which, I mean, you're seeing the earnings. Take, take us through your thoughts on, you saw NVIDIA had earnings that was interesting, Palo Alto Networks. Yeah, so I think two examples that Palo Alto Networks beat pretty significantly and great margins, great operating margins. And their story has always been consolidating all these bespoke tools and they're executing beautifully. And they're also, they're dealing with the macro very well. We know that deals are getting broken up, large deals into smaller deals. Uh, there's more uh, approvals and sequence of events that have to occur. And Palo Alto got way ahead of that. So, you know, props to them, I mean, really, Strong story there. I think NVIDIA is different. NVIDIA actually didn't have that great a quarter. I mean, the company's revenues dropped 20%. Uh, it, 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 it did guide strength in, in data center, but it, I think a lot of it is momentum around AI. They're saying, hey, all this new AI and, and, and chat GPT stuff is going to require uh, and, and NVIDIA chips. And, and we think that's a huge upside for us. That kind of replaces the crypto buzz, which I'm still high on crypto. I think it's good. We'll, we'll be good there. We can talk about that. But, but I, I feel like Nvidia was more. You know, Jensen was his visionary self on the earnings call. So I think they were quite different. I think Palo Alto's executing. And Nvidia is more speculative with a company that has really the pole position in in AI chips. Well, I mean, also gaming, right? Gaming, everyone loves gaming. And totally. Everyone wants And you they mentioned that's coming back. So G yeah, GPUs absolutely. are there and you got the, got, the, got the cost there. I mean, there's so much money coming into the, the startups now, Dave. Seed and early stage startups are booming. Series A startups are, are not doing well. Um, this is the best time to do a startup right now. The VCs are in the trenches. Um, you start to see the success formula it's scale, it's data, it's AI, the generative AI, again, there's more, again, this is going to be a, a bubble, I think, for sure, with, with Gen AI. And I think Gen AI, Gen AI is going to trump the crypto um, entrepreneurial formula. So um, I think if you look at some of the trends from a funding standpoint, from what I'm hearing in Silicon Valley and, and seeing directly is there's no funding for anything NFT related, that's dead, okay? Crypto on hold, yeah, there might be some deals done for some boutiques, 
but all the alpha entrepreneurs that were deep in the tech side of crypto and blockchain are moving into AI because it's flush with cash. I mean, they're, the, the spraying of the money around for seed funding for anything AI related is, is pretty hot right now. That's not being talked about in the press right now, but certainly here in Silicon Valley, you raise your hand with an AI startup and you have chops, you're going to get funding like in a nanosecond. There's plenty of capital. So that's going to be very interesting. The, the crypto alpha geeks are going to AI. But I do think those worlds are going to collide. I mean, the, the whole premise behind, you know, blockchain and crypto is cutting out the middleman and, and, and driving, you know, more efficient markets, whether it's fintech or health tech, et cetera. And I think AI plays a role in that. I think those two worlds are going to collide. Uh, and, and, and I don't think it's, um, they're mutually exclusive is, is all I'm saying. You, you mentioned competition and the first mover advantage for open AI and chat GPT. Um, I was shown a demo today of Notion is a, one, of the, one of those AI companies. They just launched their own AI piece of it this week and it's getting rave reviews. Um, that's more AI hitting the scene. Again, you got Google with their kind of competitor. They didn't really kind of downplay it. And then you got obviously open AI and you got Amazon. And then you got the people banning it. So it's, I think that's a signal of, of a market. Why would the banks ban ChatGPT? Okay, when on the other hand, everyone's starting companies around it. Not ready for prime time. Is it security? Is it liability? Is it fear? I mean, I know a lot of people I talk to are like, I'm really nervous to put out anything that's AI related because I don't know what, what the impact's going to be. There's a little bit of a fear there unless you can control and prompt it properly like some of the things we've used it for use cases and others have, have had success with, but generally the vibe is like euphoric, but scared. What, what do you make of that? I, 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 um, I hope I'm not mis speaking here, but I, I think in one of the earnings calls, I think it was Palo Alto Networks and Akesha Aurora, I think it was, said he was on a plane to India to give some speech and he, he took a speech and he ran it through chat GPT. And he said, oh my God, it made it so much better. <laughs> and so the CEO of a major company saying, wow, this is just making me a better communicator. And then I think, yeah. you know, your point about the banks, you remember the banks were like, oh, we'll never do crypto. And then crypto is crap. And then Jamie Dimon was like, hey, we got this crypto thing. So, I mean, they're just, look at You think they're just they're, not first movers. I think it's greed and fear. They're, right now they're in fear mode. And when the, the money's there, they'll start getting greedy. Talk about the, uh, the, 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 the memo you saw, the newsletter around the, the professor, because I think this is really the catch here. There are people that actually know what's going on with the AI and people who don't. And the ones who don't tend to are in a wait and see classic, maybe first follower or the last ones to come on, come through. But right now the first mover early adopters are all over this. They're very positive on this. Genevieve. I am. I was, I was uh, last Saturday morning, I was talking to my wife and my daughter and I was like, hey, and I was doing this like chat GPT example. I'm, I think I'm, and I'm being obnoxious with them because I'm always talking about chat GPT and running stuff through and having it write poems and like, look at this, look at this. And so, but I, and I said, we, I said, John and I talked on our podcast last, last week about UNC banning it. And I think that's a big mistake. And I, and, and I got this visceral reaction from my, my wife and my daughter, like, no way. I don't blame them because it's cheating, et cetera, et cetera. And then the flip side of that was the professor at the Wharton School, which was my argument was, no, you have to learn how to interact with the machines. It's that creativity that should be taught. It's, it's humans and machines working together. And what this professor did is he said, I am, I'm showing my, I'm teaching my class, forcing them to learn how to do progressively more sophisticated prompts yeah. and to observe how much more, how much better the quality is when you prompt it and what knobs you can turn and how powerful that is. That to me, John, is the future of humans and machines working together and should be taught. Yeah, and I think I think what you're getting at here, that's something I talked with Amar Awadal about at uh, Victara and Ed Albany's chief operating, for, again, former Cloudera, big data guy. So they know a little bit about this. The applications are, you, you know, enthusiastic. People are seeing the euphoric about the chat GPT. People see the value instantly, but there's a kind of an, un those are the application side of it. There's going to be a slew of new super apps or AI apps that are going to come out and it'll be embedded in. But Dave, if you think about this next wave of generative AI, it kind of looks the same as AWS. And I mentioned this with Swami from AWS when he talked, the early days of AWS was you didn't have to provision a data center to get code going. That was the entire premise of the early days of Amazon Web Services. You know, if you were a startup, there's no way you'd buy servers and a router and go get a rack and a, and a colo. You would provision it on the cloud. 
Pay a little on your credit card. Pennies on the dollar of value. Really amazing. And then became the undifferentiated heavy lifting. In AI, it, had this, it has the same effect as the lar these large language models are like, in the old days, the provision was heavy, you expensive. You had to build it out, build out the training, it was very expensive. And I think now what Swami was getting at and what Amar Awadala was getting at is, is that with the new situation, an IAS pass SaaS concepts emerging. There's infrastructure, there's a platform. At the end of the day, it's the app set matter. So you start to see these early developers of AI apps looking a lot like the developers that were jumping on AWS. Swami lit up like a Christmas tree. Said, oh my God, you're totally right. And Amar's like, absolutely, there's gonna be a tsunami of apps, the next Dropbox, the next apps that were built on AWS, Airbnbs, they were all built on AWS, will be on this new so, LLM. So the LLMs are now do all the heavy lifting. That's the Amazon I, story. That's AWS. I, I think it's a powerful image that you're portraying here because you're right. Amazon turned the data center into, into an API and large language models and generative AI are going to turn many, many tasks, provisioning IT being just one of many, writing and, 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 so, and, and drawing so many things. They're going to, that this is going to turn uh, those capabilities, those services into human language interaction. So the, you're going to be speaking, you know, or you know, typing, but communicating in, 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 in the English language to fire off all these services yeah. out of the box. I mean, that is yeah. really I mean, think about, think game about, changing. Think about some of the conversations we've had in theCUBE. I remember saying years ago, Dave, Google can't search what John and Dave said on theCUBE. Tell me more. ChatGPT can. If we take our language models for the cube and said, hey, John and Dave talked about super cloud. Can you get the definition of what John and Dave said? It would spit it out. Yeah. So that's not a query you can type into Google. You can't say Google, what did John and Dave say? So that's going to eliminate forms. Hey, computer, like Star Trek, get me a, a hotel in Barcelona. I need an um, extra leg room flight and here's my price point. Done. Here comes back. So this be begins the interface. That's the application. So, you know, this is this is limiting, making things so much efficient and easy. This is like this is why I think it's a game changer. The memo, oh my God, a great memo, better speech, better blog post. That's kind of a reality we see, but it's going way beyond that. It's going to be an interface. I thought, I thought Nir Zook said it well on the cube. He said, with, within five years, he said, he said, we was talking about socks. He said, within five years, every sock is going to be AI powered. Not going to replace your job, but every sock's going to be AI powered. I think so many jobs are going to be AI powered within five years. Not all jobs, you know, you're not going to, AI is not going to rake your leaves for you, uh, but, it, but it's going to, anything that's cognitive is going to be AI powered. There's, there's no question in my mind within the, well before this decade ends. Well, Dave, let's get into areas that you think this week were cringeworthy or newsworthy uh, from a rant standpoint. I know you last week, you opened my eyes to the FTC and I then checked it out. The Wall Street Journal article had a report that the commissioner of the FCC had quit and threw Lena Khan under the bus. Um, and that was interesting because I'm like, you brought that to my attention. Like, hmm, I never really you know, looked at it that way. So interesting, the FC, F, FCC, F, FTC commissioner is gone. What's yeah, it gets worse. You know, the tech lash continues and the and the attack on, on big companies. The, the story came out this week, the FTC was colluding with the EU to kill a, 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 an $8 billion acquisition of a startup in the genetic sequencing space. And so Lumina was going to buy this company, was trying to buy this company that detects the probability of cancer. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce had to use the Freedom of Information Act and sue the FTC to get the relevant docs, which again show the FTC had concerns about the potential for making it harder to compete. No evidence necessarily. The point is the FTC continues to force its anti-tech, anti-big company agenda in ways that lack transparency, doing end runs, and they better be careful what they wish for because their actions run the risk of making the U.S. less competitive, as was the case, I would argue, with NVIDIA and ARM. Yeah. Instead of supporting that, the U.S. government sued NVIDIA and killed that deal with the EU. My opinion, big mistake. So what, is that, what does that really mean? Why is that happening, in your opinion? Is it just 
incompetence? Is there an agenda? Is it political? Because you're it, starting to see this is the whole S section 230 that gets me pissed off is that there's so many politically and social justice warrior agendas involved that have nothing to do with the outcome for users and society. Yeah, I mean, you you know me, I'm like down the middle politically, but Lena Khan was, was appointed and approved to the FTC, not as chairperson. She, that was that was a move later. So she sort of slid in. And it, I, I think it would have been a different confirmation process that they said, okay, she's going to be uh, uh, the chairperson because she has an agenda. She's trying to change the standard by which, you know, monopolies uh, or, or big companies are regulated, not actual damage to consumers and illegally using monopoly power, but the potential for that. And uh, that is, I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong, but to put that kind of power in one person's hand, I think is really dangerous. And the unintended consequences, especially when you like, say, you got China floating satellites, disrupting, l- trying to lead an AI. You know, you People start about the China attacking. balloon. They got China balloon. Everyone's talking about the China balloon that fell down. Oh, it is. It's a big, it's but, big but they got 13,000 satellites going to be roaming by 2027. Talk about taking over the, <laughs> taking over this, the, the new frontier, Space Force. Space is the next Navy. It's the next, it, it's like, it, it's like another war zone. It's going to it, be a battle, highly contested and highly congested environment. And there are no rules of engagement in space. I mean, there's going to be a satellite war, in my opinion, coming. And next battleground's AI, you know, AI and chips. Okay, and we're limiting China's access to you know a lot of lot of semiconductor technologies, but China's all over AI. And who's you said it earlier in this episode? Well, who are the big AI players? Amazon, Microsoft, Google, you know, etc. And and the U.S. government is basically attacking them. And that, well, that AI, have AI wars, Dave. That is so. Funny, I was going to bring this up in my rant section. I got a pitch from a PR firm. The adult industry is adopting AI. They're having porn stars versus AI stars, porn stars. So you have synthetic, this is real news. This is what's really out there. Dave, I mean, really? The adult industry? Real porn stars against AI bots. That's real. <laughs> Uh, speechless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. What's your reaction I, to I that? Guess, well, I guess it's like. Well, you know, porn is porn's always the early adopter of technology. Yeah, gaming. Porn you know. and and I guess hackers are always ahead of the game. Right? Uh, it's gonna be I, AI, I It's where everything will be AI infused. My point. My point is, AI war. AI. You're starting to see adult industry. Every vertical is impacted by AI. Again, this is just more proof that we're kind of going down a new societal impact role. What is the What's the rules of engagement? What's real? What's the truth? What's going to be synthetic? What's going to be legit? Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of you know, struggling. I mean, I, I was I had in the saw my here my rant list here. Social media is causing um, uh, depression issues for you know younger teens, especially females. So social media is causing kinds of problems, causes kinds of anxiety and issues. So you know there are societal impacts to I won't say regulation. I'm not saying I want regulation, but you know. There is a responsibility. While Facebook's printing money with their amazing targeting system, they looked the other way and broke democracy, causing problems. I don't think the social media big giants have done well in my book. I mean, the iPhone's been a great innovation, but I can't say outside of Apple what other companies are actually doing good. I mean, I don't, I don't really fault Apple at all. I think Apple is probably the best. You don't see Apple. They're good on security. They're proprietary. Um, they have good um, ethics. And Amazon, I will say too, Andy Jassy says, you know, he's got first principles. So, you know, you have some companies that just aren't leaning into the first principles and have any kind of ethics. So, well, you know, John Markoff and I talked about this again this week in New York City. The AI ethics has been going on for many years, decades, actually. So there's a lot of work, I think, that's going to come to the surface on AI, Dave, this next year, next two years. There's been a lot of work and everyone gets all glammed up by the shiny new chat GPT and then everyone raises scare tactics like, oh my God, security, ethics. Um, but it does bring it mainstream. So I think you're going to see a lot more academic folks dro- rolling into the marketplace, bringing out research. You'll see new kinds of data emerging and you know it's a health issue. I, I think Google and Facebook are sort of the most exposed here in this topic, John, because they're, they're living off of ads. 
I, I think Amazon's exposed because of you know you know labor and the warehouses and all the whole union thing. You know, Apple with the App Store. Microsoft maybe is the most insulated, ironically. You know, the company that the the, the DOJ tried to tried to take down. Um, but I, again, I come back to markets are ultimately going to determine the winners and losers, and there will be new disruption. There will be, you know, a, a next wave of giants. It's this, the, you know, it's not over in my view. You're going to, you know, some, whether it's Musk or the next Steve Jobs is going to come out and create something that's going to blow the world away. It may take another decade, but, and I think, you know, it's interesting. A lot of this, a lot of the innovation, you said a great time to start a company. A lot of the innovation that we're seeing today started, you know, mid 2000s, 2006, 2007, 2008, when the economy was in the tank. You know, here we are again with these sort of strange, you know, macro conditions. Valuations are down. It's a great time to start a company. Yeah, I mean, a lot of news, Dave. AI, earnings, this new waves coming. Where's the money going to be? I mean, you're on, you're, you're on, you're looking at the charts. You're in, you're breaking analysis. You're doing a lot of work looking at the landscape. You got the cloud native, cloud scale going on, super cloud. You got the edge we discussed. Again, AI will be the wild card in all this, which I think is going to be an amazing thing, notwithstanding some of the societal issues. Um, startups are emerging. This is the beginning where recoveries come from. So all the action for long game players that are coming into the seed are going to harvest. So again, all this and here in Silicon Valley, certainly from my standpoint, what I'm seeing directly and hearing and, and observing and reporting on is that there's a kick-ass load of VCs in the trenches, a lot of startups leaning in. AI is obviously the hottest because that brings more of the comp side to it. Blockchain, a little bit different kind of vibe, but overall very healthy. Meanwhile, I, I, no one's spending any cash because the economy's in the tank. <laughs> what are you seeing? I, I, I do think, it is, first of all, the economy is very seesaw right now. <laughs> I, I said this the other day, uh, gas, gas futures got, are getting tanked. And have caught everybody off guard. Natural gas. It's like, whoa, we're just slingshotting or seesawing. But I think, I think it's the application of AI that is, is going to be a big winner. And I think security is still number one. You got too many players. You got these consolidation trends going on. You got examples like Palo Alto, but there are so many startups ripe for MA. So there's definitely money to be made there. But also how AI is applied is going to separate uh, uh, companies and you know create new new leaders in my view what are they going to look like what do those leaders look like i what think they're going to create create new models of efficiency i'm thinking enterprise now new models of efficiency in terms of uh, uh, of, of how infrastructure is managed and deployed and 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 and, and fixes itself which already you're seeing today it's how we secure across the networks. And you said this earlier, edge. Edge, huge disruptive factor. And, and I, it starts with semiconductors. ARM is, is the enabler there. It's dominating at the edge. It's got 10X the, the wafer volumes of, of x86. And, and it's got a lower cost, lower power. We talked about power earlier in this whole ESG movement and greening of the network. And, 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 New AI inference at the edge is going to create, in my view, huge disruption to the traditional way in which IT is done. Well, I mean, a lot going on. We got the we got this Mobile World Congress for the Cube. Um, that's going to be next week. You guys are going to be out there. We saw Tesla news. Uh, they're under a lot of pressure with their the cars. Um, obviously, Twitter, Twitter with Elon Musk, a whole other story. Again, I don't have enough time to dig into that. But you know, you got a lot of new modern evolutions going on, Dave. And I think the gen, generative AI and the AI field right now, to me, I think it's the next big inflection point, like a big one, like not like a little one, like a big one, like as big as uh, the PC generation, that that wave, uh, as big as the mobile smartphone, iPhone wave. I think this is an iPhone moment categorically for AI because there's applications. And I think the chat GPT thing proves to me that that user interface, the application of how users are using it, is that that's the sea change. And that's just the front end. There's going to be a yes, back so end and it's going to be scaled up. And I think a lot of companies are going to jump in to make it easier, more efficient. 
so people can tap the efficiency. And you know, I asked Amr Awadala to explain it to me in, in, in simple terms, like I'm a two-year-old. He goes, it's like Google Maps with GPS. Before you drive the car, you'd be on a map, and then you'd have maps, MapQuest printed out, and then you have GPS on a map, and your car does it for you. You never even look at a map. The GPS and the map mashup is great. This is kind of what this is getting into a whole nother level of automating intelligence, automating and, and prompt engineering into the system. I mean, just the, that sentence alone is a mind blower. Yeah, and I think there's consumer angles here that can be enormous. And, and again, I think the IoT, the intelligent factories, the, the, the industrial tech, uh, industry 4.0, all of that is going to be dramatically affected by AI, AI real-time inferencing at the edge in every industry, fintech, you know, much, much better uh, uh, fraud detection, manufacturing. I think you're going to potentially see some manufacturing, you know, move back into the U.S. and or other parts of the world, India, South America. Uh, I, I think I think retail, new experiences. Um, you know, just being able to to visualize what something looks like, which has been relatively poor, yeah. and that's going to change the whole retail experience. It's going to affect every industry, consumer, and enterprise, and and I think it's going to be a new wave of productivity that hits. So I think the three things I walk away with from this podcast that we kind of agree on, rift on, was one, generative AI as a top wave, big time, that you have the cloud scale edge coming into play with massive disruption, the telco is an indicator, but that, I'd call that the, the cloud native continuation of dominance and, and enabling, again, next gen capabilities, super cloud-like capabilities, including more AI apps, for instance, um, that'll look a lot like DevOps, DevSecOps for AI. And then third, society issues, Dave, FTC and all this shit going on around, the, around, around our government and the global e political landscape. So, you know, gen AI is disrupting, you got the cloud infrastructure edge, and then you got society that's sideways with tech. What the hell? I agree with your chat, GPT, AI, generative AI, the, the future of, of war, the future of industry sort of all fits in there. I think telco, Disruption comes down to the disaggregation of that stack. It's like the big bang and telco. Yeah. That's just going to open up tons of opportunities. And, and I, I, I also agree with you. Public policy is going to become incredibly important. I think public policy could be an enabler or it can be a barrier to national competitiveness. And my concern is that we're constricting the latter. I mean, I'm, I'm sensitive to doing the right thing and not allowing big companies to abuse small companies and abuse consumers. But again, the unintended consequences of government actions uh, scare me a little bit. Well, we've got a lot of good stuff coming up next week. Um, Mobile World Congress, we're gonna do a lot of in-studio. We did a lot this week, uh, SiliconANGLE editorial interviews. You're gonna see a lot more video reporting. So if you're listening to the pod and watching this pod, you're gonna see a lot more reporting on news that matters in these areas. We're gonna continue to add, add, to, add to more stuff on siliconangle.com with video in the cube. So, a lot more events coming up. It's going to be a, a good year for content, and, I'm sure. And let me just say, if you're at MWC, stop by the Cube where it stand CS60, right in between halls four and five in the walkway yeah. at, at uh, you know Congress Square. We've got a great setup. It's going to be amazing. So definitely, if you have stories or insights, yeah. or you see something really cool, come by, we'll try to get you on. I'll be in Palo Alto doing live remotes with Dave Yu on, from Barcelona. I'll be in studio doing some reporting and interviews. And also breaking news for us, everyone out there listening, RSA conference, we actually have space on the floor. The Cube is going to be there reporting and certainly in studio. We'll be there with a the set in Media Row there up in Moscone in San Francisco at the end of April uh, for the big security show. So a lot of security, a lot of, a lot of action with AI. Dave, great, great to um, get this pod in. Second one, we got two in, in, in the books. I love it, John, it flies by. And, and I love doing it on top of my breaking analysis because I'm because I got my clothes on, I'm You're all fresh. dressed up. You're all fresh in the brain, <laughs> to the RAM, all your topics. It's a great way to end the week. Well, Man, I like, I I like, I like riffing, it's good to put down some of the things we're looking at. And, and again, if anyone's got feedback about the podcast, we're gonna, we're gonna chip away at this, we're gonna get our groove swing. I think probably after 10 or so, Dave, maybe 10 to 20 pods will get rolling you know, get the format down, we'll start bringing in guests, get more news, keep it focused. That was the good feedback, keeping things in chunks. We'll keep getting better. Um, and, uh, 
you know, one viewer at a time. Thanks for listening. If you're on YouTube and it's looking angle for watching and listening and let us know what you think. DM us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. We're all, so all, all channels are open. Thanks for watching.